Okay, Barbara, we are live. Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, depending on whether you're in our international audience. I am so pleased to be able to do the U.S. book launch for Kate Moss and her amazing new book, The Ghost Ship, which I'm here to say is already a number one in the UK because they publish earlier than we do here in the US. I think on Thursdays is a general rule in order to catch their media. So Kate already knows before we even start that she's a number one bestseller. How cool is that? Um, interviewing Kate today is Dr. Amanda Foreman, author of one of my all-time favorite books, Georgina, Duchess of Devonshire. But she, well, if there's time, we could talk to Amanda, but the focus here is Kate. So let me just do, I mean, summing up Kate is nearly impossible, but in a very condensed version, I will tell you that Kate Moss, who lives in Chichester and who has written, by the way, a really marvelous memoir of what it's like to be a caregiver, a full-time caregiver, um, which I highly recommend to you. She is the multiple New York Times, the number one internationally best-selling author with sales of more than 8 million copies in 38 languages. Her previous novels include Labyrinth, still one of my all-time favorite books, Sepulchre, Sepulchre, The Winter Ghost, Citadel, and The Taxidermist's Daughter. She's the founder, director of the Women's Prize for Fiction, a visiting professor at the University of Chichester, and in June 2013 was awarded the OBE for Services to Literature. She's also a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and president of the Festival of Chichester. And so the question you're going to ask me when I show you this book is how in the world does she ever have time to write when she's so busy doing all of that? So Kate, you want to say a word or two about how your superpowers come into play? Superpowers, Barbara, how lovely to be back with you. It's always such a pleasure to see you and all of your amazing uh, readers and listeners uh, to this and particularly to be in conversation with my lovely friend um, Amanda Foreman, Dr. Amanda Foreman. The thing is, Barbara, I don't do all this stuff at the same time. You know, I'm in my 60s now. I know you you, you uh, beat me, everybody into a cock hat. You look about 20 and there you go. But, um, you know, you when you read all this stuff out, I, you know, I do it at different times and I do get up really early. <laughs> Okay, well, there you are. She obviously has focus, serious focus. Um, and I, I've never asked Kate how many languages she speaks, but she's clearly fluent in French. So if I say to her Louis XIII, she actually, you know, responds. <laughs> anyway, my question before I retire gracefully and listen to this, um, which I've asked both of them, is because the role of individuals is so important in this book and in uh, Dr. Foreman's book, Georgiana, the great man theory of history is just one, but I've always thought it was a very, it was an interesting one to explore. Can one individual actually change the direction of events? And we could go back to Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt in the 20th century. Right now we're looking at Zelensky and uh, who knew that he would step up in the way that he has in the Ukraine. But in Kate's case here, she's talking about Henri IV, Henri of Navarre, and Louis XIII and Louis XIV and the effect that their reigns and their rulings had on the Huguenot, the French Protestants who mostly left France. And in this book, they go to the Canaries, they go to Amsterdam, the Canaries, and French Hook in Cape Town. Where I have to tell you, Kate, I've sailed in and out and I thought about them so many times, plus the wine. Wine's amazing. Um, but they also, I think, went to Spitalfields and did a lot of weaving in London. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they yeah. did, right? Okay. So anyway, what is your thought, both of you, about the great man theory? Well, I, I think it is, it's a valid theory, actually. But you need a whole conjunction of other things to happen at the same time. And we could call that, as we look around, particularly in Britain at the moment, um, enablement. So it, one person can change the course of history, but only if the mass movements going on around enable them to do so. So that they turn a blind eye to their excesses, they um, empower them to have much more, you know, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Foreman will know this, but the, you know, the word dictator comes from a, a, a much more sensible Latin, uh, you know, Roman way of doing things, is that somebody who was given absolute power for a fixed period of time in order to have the power to make change. So with the case of the ghost ship, uh, you know, one of the things at the very beginning is the assassination of Henry IV. And I would say it's not fanciful to say that if he had not been assassinated in May 1610, the French Revolution probably 
would not have happened because his loss, he was a modernizing king. He was changing everything he understood about what we would now call the middle class, the aspirational people. And he was bringing peace to France between the Catholics and Huguenots. And because he was assassinated, his uh, son and then grandson, they went back to persecuting the Huguenots for their Protestant faith and they destroyed France. And everywhere that the Huguenots went, they enriched society and they took their gratitude and their hard work and their skills. And because many of them fled to Holland, uh, the United Provinces as it would become, that tiny little country of Holland became a global superpower, partly because they accepted the Huguenot refugees in. So if Henry IV had not been assassinated, a huge amount of European history would have been completely different. So there. <laughs> Well, we could we could mention Abraham Lincoln. I've always I think many of us certainly in America feel that if Lincoln hadn't been assassinated, the whole end of the Civil there War idea would have been dramatically different. But anyway, um, I find you know it's fascinating looking at current events as I as I said to recognize whether just one man's personality and conviction and courage. I've often thought Britain would never have made it through the war without Churchill, but you know. I was only yeah. four, <laughs> so so I don't remember it all that well, but there we are. So Dr. Foreman, over to you. Gosh, well, that was absolutely fascinating. And thank you for inviting me to talk about uh, Kate's wonderful new book, The Ghost Ship, which uh, is the third of what's going to be a quatrain uh, in this particular series. And I was want to say what pleasure it is to, to to be able to take part in the Poison Pen Bookshop series, live series of talks, because uh, I'm talking from New York. Uh, you, Barbara, you're, you're in Scottsdale and Kate, you're in Europe. And so all of it's a truly international uh, exercise we're doing. And, and I think it's a, it's a tribute both to you, Barbara, that you have this incredible expansive reach that goes right, right, not just in Arizona, but right across the US and across the Atlantic. And Kate, of course, you are so beloved on both sides of the pond. And, and so the, the reason I think that you are so loved, both for what you do and for what you write, is because you are a modern Balzac. And so this is why we've come together to discuss the ghost ship, because so Balzac wrote this amazing series, the Comedy of Men, which uh, it, it covers these interconnected families that come in and out and pop up over time. And he explores these different themes and the, and the characters are extraordinary and include um, uh, characters who are bisexual or you know, gay or lesbian or you know, this or that, outsiders are good characters, bad characters, indifferent characters, and and it's the, and there's a great love for all of them, including the villains. And so this, I think, is a, a kind of foreshadowing of what you have been able to achieve in your series, because they are all in some extraordinary way interconnected. So before we get to the ghost ship, I think it's important for um, people who, who are and have joined us if we can kind of put the ghost ship into context, because although you say it's a standalone and it reads perfectly as a standalone novel, it also does fit in within this wider universe. So can you, for us, describe what this wider universe is before we dive into the particular? Yes, thank you so much. And, and just to echo what you've said about the poison pen, this is why for me, I, sadly, I can't be in the States uh, for this publication. I'm in the middle of a 30 date uh, UK tour at the moment. I'm speaking to you uh, from a hotel bedroom in Oxford. I can hear the bells ringing, which is all fantastic. Um, but also I've never been uh, compared to what, well, suggested that I'm walking in the footsteps of Balzac. And I take that as a great compliment. I'm an enormous fan as you would not be surprised to know. So this series of four novels, uh, is inspired by the Huguenot diaspora. Um, and that my very deep belief that the Huguenots of, uh, as a group of refugees that went all over the world, enriched every society, as I said, that they went to 
that they are extraordinarily uh, hardworking and able and focused and transformative group of people. And European history is very much dominated by religious war, wars of religion and the consequence of wars of religion. And I deliberately use religion rather than faith because usually wars of religion are about power. And so this series of four books uh, follows from the eve of the wars of religion in France, which started on the 1st of March, 1562, and will finish in Franschhoek uh, in the wine lands of the Western Cape in South Africa in 1862. And essentially it is a Romeo and Juliet stamp for, uh, story between a Catholic family and a Protestant family, a fam different families that have been at feud for 300 years. Um, it's very much about uh, women in a man's world. It's about how Europe started to learn to look out from itself to the rest of the world. And of course, many Huguenots came to Carolina, very important Huguenot heritage um, in America. And um, as Barbara said, many went to England as it then was, although I don't go anywhere near England. I stay in France and uh, the Netherlands and South Africa. Each of the novels has, um, is bounded by real history. We'll talk about research a bit later on, but the real history of what happened and the people who made it happen. But each of my novels is an imagined character set against the backdrop of real history. So in The Burning Chambers, it's the girl meets boy story against the wars of religion starting. In The City of Tears, it's the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, which was the turning point in the wars of religion. They could have finished in 1572, but because of the massacre, they went on for another generation. And in the ghost ship, uh, it does kind of stand alone because it's a pirate novel and pirates are outsiders. And then the fourth one will be the resolution in South Africa. And uh, each of them has an element. So the burning chambers, of course, is fire. The city of tears, of course, is water. The ghost ship, of course, is air. And then finally, we will come to Earth um, in the, uh, the concluding novel of the series. So, but so far, The Ghost Ship's my favourite because it was so much fun to write. Yeah, I, I, I can tell. Though, uh, so fascinating that, that you have mentioned the, that, that these books are, are based around the four elements. Because one of the really fascinating aspects of your writing in your, in your novels is that they are very tightly bound, all of them, around the three Ps. So uh, person, place, and purpose. <laughs> Lovely. And, and, thank you. And the, I, it seems to me, though, that this series is also connected, not just because it's set in France, with your earlier series. The, the, some people call it the Labyrinth series, other people call it the, the Longer Doc series. That it's, it is, in some extraordinary way, it's a... It, it's a continuation. It's different, but it's also a continuation of that earlier series. Now, would you agree with that in some respect, or do you feel that that's not the case? I, I think absolutely that at the heart of all of my fiction is place. The idea that the landscape is a character, sometimes the biggest character. And that, of course, goes back, you know, I am very English, as you know, and it goes back to reading Wuthering Heights at school and thinking, oh, OK. You know, I'd been reading Jane Austen, of course, before that. And I, obviously Jane Austen is a genius. But for me, too many bonnets and pianos. You know, it was fine, but there was nothing big about it or epic about it. So it won't surprise you to know that two of my favourite writers, one is Emily Bronte and the other is the great American writer, Willa Cather. Uh, that sense of enormous landscape, the idea that landscape, you couldn't just pick the story up and tell it somewhere else. It comes out of the place you're in. So of course that means that the Joubert Family Chronicles and the Longer Doc trilogy do fit in that way because they are all love letters to place. They also have something else in common, which is very much that the protagonist is a woman. And this is not about changing history or distorting history or taking the beautiful and gorgeous men out, but it is about putting women who lived back into history because it's not, that women uh, were invisible. It was that the writing of history made women invisible. And another thing that this series and the Longer Doc trilogy has in common, particularly Labyrinth, 
is the power of women writing and words and books. And it's a theory, I'm not a historian, but I do believe that one of the reasons that uh, the Protestant faith became so powerful relatively quickly in Europe, and of course that carried on, and it's very, I would say very significant in the United States of America, is that within the Protestant faith, women were allowed to write and publish. And so both the series of books have the fact that women writing down their stories and the handing those stories on and those books on to the next generation of women going down the line is a very key uh, plot device, but it also it kind of embeds it all down. And, you know, we must remember we live in a world where girls are shot for going to school. So a woman writing is still transgressive. Um, and so I think that holds it in mind. And of course, that was the challenge for the ghost ship, that the landscape in the ghost ship is the sea. And that is not my natural habitat. Gosh, but it's so interesting that you've gone straight to this point because in one of your novels, you say, you say, write yourself, your body must be heard. Write yourself, your body must be heard. And so you, you link the writing with the physicality, the existence, and also the experience that is meted on women because they are women and also that that physical experience that they that, that your characters have they give birth they lose children they just fight, refine children i mean they, they they very much suffer um as women and then of course on the very second page of the ghost ship you say the same thing but diff said differently but it clearly this is your mantra um it was my grandmother who taught me the importance of writing, uh, taught me the importance of telling one's own story. And that's the first thing, which is what you just said, for another reason, which is that if not, you're going to be allowing the words of others to stand for you or stand in for you. So, so it's both, you must be able to write your story because if you don't, someone else will write it for you and it won't yeah. be your story, it'll be their story. And that, and in, the, the Citadel, which is the third volume of the Longer Dock series, these, your, the characters, the, the, the heroines do not survive. I hate to be a you know, spoiler alert there. It's set during the Second World War, during the Resistance, and these heroines, they don't survive, and the Nazis attempt, the, the collaborators attempt to obliterate their existence, literally, with a grenade. And, and so your writing is about de-obliterating yes, women's yes. existence. Yes, and also I would say um, all of the history in my books is insofar as you can ever be sure what happened. It is what happened. Things happen on the right date. They happen within the right context. Uh, the inspirations and motivations and the consequences are there as the majority of historians coalesce and agree around that. But my characters are imagined people. And the point about that is, particularly with Citadel, which it looks like it's about to be a big film, which would be rather wonderful, uh, because it is inspired by the death of two real resistance women who have been wiped out of history. Nobody knows who they are. But for me, with these stories, and the ghost ship is exactly the same, is about putting the shadows of women more centre stage. So I, my pirate commander, uh, the ghost ship has very much a central female character, more than most of my novels, where there is a kind of polyphony um, of voices. There are lead characters, but there's more of them. This is very much Louise Joubert's novel. But her character is not based on any one real female pirate, but it is inspired by all of the female pirates that I could find. So, and we don't know enough about any of them. You could never write really a novel about any of them. But in terms of trying to put the, sh you know, chase away the shadows, that, that's, I suppose, what it is. Um, so let's go to Louise Joubert. And again, in order to really appreciate Louise Joubert, who's a marvelous character in and of herself, she is part of this massive tapestry that you have been you know, literally weaving together. And these are 
strands which are woven together. And so some of the aha moments that come out of this book, they're fantastic. They're even more fantastic when um, they're seen against this kind of bigger, larger background of other stories. So perhaps if you could just explain who is Louise Joubert, because she's not the first Joubert to have that name. In fact, she's like the third generation. So can you just kind of, in a nutshell, why is she so important? Why, why are we all gagging to know about Louise Joubert? <laughs> she, that's a lovely way of asking that question. Uh, she is uh, the granddaughter of the man and the woman who we first meet in the burning chambers and we follow their story in the City of Tears. It's why the ghost ship can be read as a standalone. And I was interviewed earlier this evening, actually, by uh, another writer, Lu yes, I know, Lucy Atkins in Blackwells in Oxford, um, who had not read the other two books. And she said, but it didn't matter because Louise appears very briefly at the end of the City of Tears as a seven-year-old child and she no, we, don't, we don't know her. So we've jumped forward two generations, essentially. She is uh, in Paris with her grandparents. The last time her grandparents were in Paris, they were caught up in the St. Bartholomew's Day massacre and had to flee to safety with only the clothes they had on their back. And one of their children was lost. And we don't know for most of the novel whether really she survived or what happened and all the rest of it. Louise is there in its 1610 because she is about to come into an inheritance and will become a very wealthy woman. Now, this is important, as you know, um, of course, um, Amanda, is that because she is about to be very wealthy, she will be able to choose not to marry, which means that she will have some measure of independence and self-determination. She will not have to fit into a societal structure. She will be able to stay slightly outside of what society's expectations for a woman of her class and type in the early 17th century would be. And, but because it's a Kate Moss novel, she is in the street and she witnesses the assassination of the great French King Henri IV. And Henry is modernizing France. He understands what a modern country needs. He has done things that seem normal to us now, but were radical then. For example, he has built two public parks. It seems so obvious, but nobody had ever done that before. Everything, people, the normal people had nowhere that they could go. But he had built these two huge parks. One of them is Place des Vosges in the heart of Paris for the people. And he was transforming French society. Now. If anybody wants to know about the assassination of Henry IV, there are many brilliant biographies of Henry IV, and I probably have read all of them. But what a reader of, a, of an adventure novel, one of my readers wants, is to know what my character, Louise Joubert, is doing at that moment. So she witnesses this. And of course, because she is from a refugee family and she has been there before, they don't wait to see what's gonna happen. They run, because last time, every single Huguenot was slaughtered. So um, that's where we are in the story and why it becomes so significantly Louise's story, because the more I wrote her, the bigger her footprint became on the page. And yet she's a forward looking character whose life has been shaped by her past. So there's this inherent tension between the two. And the, the question is, and in fact, for many of your characters, if they don't know their story, they don't know their true identity, and many of your characters don't know their true identity, uh, how can they be their true selves? So how, what, how do you reconcile that? Well, I think it's um, oddly, given my books are uh, complicated in terms of being tightly plotted and based on real history and research and things, when I'm writing the first draft, I am writing to discover what the story is. I don't know what the story is. I don't have a plan. With The Ghost Ship, I knew I was writing a pirate novel. I knew it was gonna be set in the early 17th century. I knew that there would be a strong uh, principled woman who would be an outsider because she'd have to be that character to become the commander of her own ship uh, because women couldn't go to sea in that period of time. It's why this book is about disguise and about women living disguised lives as well. But then I start writing. So I don't know 
what's happened to Louise in her past, but I know something has, because I knew that there need to be a kind of recovered memory story, as it were, because as you say, Amanda, one of the reasons she's an outsider is that there are gaps in her memory. She doesn't quite know who she is. And so she as the character and me as the author are discovering her story together. And when I thought, ah, oh, yes, that, that's what happened. That makes sense to me. And then there are other things that I'll write and I'll think, actually, that doesn't make any sense. And then we'll you know, change in the second draft and the third draft and often the fourth draft. So I let my characters tell me who they are. Now your see. characters almost never get what they want. They get half of what they want. They can't have their cake and eat it too, they get, as it were. They, can, they, they get one and then they spend the rest of their lives figuring it out, figuring out how to kind of make it work. So with Louise, you know, she meets the great love of her life, but of course it's complicated. So what is that complication? Well, I can't really tell you very much about that because obviously it's a, quite significantly um, a spoiler alert, although um, Amazon managed to half give a spoiler alert in that a couple of well, without, days ago. without spoilers yes. <laughs> I know without spoilers so um yes so what I would say is that again I know when I sit down that I'm writing a pirate novel I know all of these kind of things but there's always something that I discover which is in a funny sort of way the one sentence explanation of the book and I think the reason that the, the book is going down so well um apart from the fact I loved writing it and I think maybe that is off the page for people, is that I was surprised to discover, oh, I see it's a love story. I don't normally write love stories. There's a great deal of love in my books. There's always people who love each other and it can be parent and child and it can be lovers, um, it can be siblings, but I don't actually write love stories in that way. But this, oddly, is a love story. And I wasn't expecting that. I had a sense of this particular other character who was very significant and I was writing this other character. And then when the love story, I suddenly thought, oh, of course, of course, this makes complete sense. There is, when they're together, a completion and they are both outsiders and they both do not want to live in the way that society tells either of them they should live, but together, they are like the old Tommy Steele film, Half a Sixpence, the two halves of a sixpence. And it was joyous for me writing that love story. And when people read the book, they will understand why it was so important that that was a successful and happy and enduring love story. So oddly, in the end, Louise gets what she doesn't think she wants, which is that, the great love of her life. Now, I want to go, I want to cut to the chase and... Uh... <laughs> And um, latch on to the, the words that you, you use, it's a pirate story about a pirate ship. Because I wonder whether that's selling it short. Because <laughs> um, uh, the, the number one, it isn't piracy as it's understood today, or even understood then. I mean, it's more like a letter, the letter of Mark only it's a personal letter of Mark. So what's the difference between that? So um, a letter, a ship that has a letter of Mark, as it were, has, um, it's an unofficial official way of conducting a war against you know, an opponent, which is different from then from just rampaging across the desert or the sea like Mad Max, wreaking havoc and destroying civilization. Of course, and you don't mean the latter, you mean the former. That's exactly right. And I would say that there are two types of pirate. Um, you're a bit younger than me. And if Barbara was English, she would know this book. But I grew up in the 60s and the 70s. And my favorite book when I was growing up was the Ladybird book about pirates. <laughs> and I loved the Ladybird book about pirates because I loved adventure stories. I loved pirate stories and was frustrated even as a sort of seven, eight year old about the fact that all of the heroes in these books were boys and there were almost no girls or women that ever even appeared in Treasure Island or um, all of these kind of books. But what I did learn from the Ladybird Book of Pirates, and it just goes to show anybody who's listening who's writing, there is nothing ever goes to waste when you're a writer because it is more than 50 years later. Um, and finally, I get to write my 
pirate story. Within that book, there are exactly the people that you're uh, you're talking about: Captain Kidd, Henry Morgan, Captain Teach, Blackbeard. These are aggressive, violent, bearded, terrible, terrible men um, who are driven by greed. Um, it's all about the treasure and treat their own crews appallingly. Uh, you know, quite often maroon them and terrible violence. There's also, though, in a tradition of pirate novels, and you're right, modern day piracy is a terrible scourge and it is awful. And it always most targets the people who have, you know, the, the least to lose, as it were, that they, they, they just, uh, you know, it's very, it's nothing to do with that, but there is a romance of the sea in piracy. There is the other type of pirate, and Louise is one of these, which you could kind of call a highwayman of the sea. And this is a tribute in a way to the great 1922 novel, uh, Captain Blood by Raphael Sabatini. And many people will maybe not know that novel, but they will know the Errol Flynn film, which is almost coming up. And that's the gentleman pirate, where there is um, a social purpose or a moral purpose. And they are almost as Louise is. They have been forced into piracy because there's no other way of making a living or there is no other way. You know, Louise couldn't be at sea as um, uh, officially because women weren't allowed on ships. They, it was considered to have very, very bad luck to have women on ships. Uh, but because she's wealthy, she has got her own ship. So this is about women in disguise. But as you say, her purpose is to disrupt slaver ships. And it's not the slavery story that will develop as that becomes people trafficking, essentially. At this beginning, exactly as you say, with the letters of Mark, there is a kind of official, unofficial uh, tit for tat going on, particularly with the Dutch East India Company, the British, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the French are all at it. And it is uh, kidnapping people from uh, villages and coastal resorts. The Canary Islands, the islands closest to uh, Morocco were completely empty. Uh, Lanzarote and Puerto Ventura are on the coast because everybody had been taken. And there are Christian slave markets and there are Muslim slave markets. And so I started to think, well, there is, Louise could have a purpose that is absolutely not about gathering bullion and, and X marks the spot but is about uh, trying to do something because there is always an assumption, and you know this better than I do, Amanda, that sometimes there's always this idea that everybody in the past agreed about something, even though we look around ourselves at the moment and know that we really don't all agree with each other. So when the Dutch East India Company had its 24 one year license and it started as a trading company, not the rather murderous colonizing company that would subsequently become. Some people realized that the trafficking of humans was going to be very profitable and other people thought it was wrong. They didn't all think it was okay. So I thought, well, there was a, a space for me as a novelist to put Louise in that camp to say, this isn't right. Yes, and there's also a space, it seems, we've put Louise in a camp where she has you know, authority and autonomy and agency. And although you refer to it as a pirate ship and obviously it's doing piratey things, it is, she doesn't have value because she's violent. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. But the, I mean, it was a very interesting thing when I was writing her character in particular, that when I'm talking to creative writing students, I always try to explain how, for me, characterization works. That describing people physically is not characterization. You have to show what people are like by their attributes. So I'll often say, okay, describe the character and somebody will say tall and I'll say, no, that's not an attribute. And they'll say, oh, okay, nervous. I said, okay, how are you gonna show them doing something that tells the reader they're nervous? And they go, oh, well, what about saying, you know, they were nervous? No, I said, no, no, no. I said, what about they're taking their wedding ring on and off repeatedly, or they keep standing up all the time, or they're checking their watch all of the time, you know, in a modern novel. So when I was writing Louise, I don't actually describe it till quite late on. And the word that I found myself using was statuesque, because this is the other thing about Louise, that she's a tall, 
strong, broad woman. She doesn't look feminine um, in the way that would have been seen as acceptable in the 17th century. But we again know that women, men, everybody come in all shapes and sizes. There was never one size fits all. And so these things are quite important. And I know what you mean about, in a way that it's not just a pirate novel, and actually only a third of the novel is actually at sea. It's more that a, a pirate ship is a floating republic. It is an interesting uh, place that exists outside of society. And often people return to dry land and they join society again. But a pirate ship has very strict hierarchies, but it is more democratic than anything you would find, oddly. So I wanted to kind of play with that. Yes, I see what you mean. That's interesting. I hadn't thought of it in that way, that you're kind of looking at these sort of democracies of the sea <laughs> and yeah. Yeah, yeah. figuring out how they work. Um, and I suppose that's the intellectual Kate, uh, as it were, coming through. Because the, the, the other thing about you that really comes through in this book and your other books is that you actually love to play. You love to play with ideas, you love to play with themes, and you are very playful. And so it, almost all your books, um, your history books, are actually also mystery books. And I know that you've actually said that Miss Marple is like one of your favourite characters. Yeah. And, and you simply cannot as it were, stop yourself from, from inserting mysteries. There's, there's I know, I know. Yeah, so, so no, what I is mean, that about? I think that all, all wonderful novels, whatever genre they're in and however we define them, um, they have to be driven by some kind of suspense. Whether that is the suspense of a beautiful literary novel um, in terms of how is the language going to work and how is the meditation going to work and the internal monologue going to work, um, or in a novel of mine, which is always the conjunction of place, history and mystery. So in The Ghost Ship, you know, for all of these things that we are talking, and it's partly because you and I are talking to each other, we, you know, we, we're both passionate about history. You're uh, an incredible trailblazer in uh, writing women's history, and I as you know, admire and love your work very much. And we operate in that way, in a very similar place. But as a novelist, my job is to entertain. And what I do, you know, if someone says to me, Kate, I am so interested, uh, read The Ghost Ship, and now I am very interested in cross-dressing and women living in disguise in the 17th century, that as a novelist, I have failed. If they say, I love Louis Schubert, I couldn't, stop turning the pages. I couldn't believe what was gonna to happen to them and will they get out of there alive? And then I've succeeded. So that's the playfulness, I suppose, that I still, um, I really love writing. Um, I love telling a good old story and, and that's the pleasure for me when people say, oh my God, I, I never saw that coming. So the mystery is about the things that we don't know about uh, people why they might be acting as they are. And this is a book about secrets in the end. You know, there's a lot of secrets, secrets about people's background, secrets about who they are. I said disguise, uh, women not living as women, all of these kind of things. But in the end, as you know, a proper good old fashioned swashbuckling adventure story is about the beginning, the middle and an end. And do you leave the reader wanting more? Right. Can yes. I, can I stick up my hand, my other hand, the one isn't, <laughs> and make a comment? Um, I made a pilgrimage a few years ago to my personal favorite female pirate called Grace O'Malley, who lives Absolutely. off the west coast of Ireland. And it reminds me when you were talking about women that, you know, for Grace to escape her father and get to sea, she had to cut off all her hair. That's uh, right. You know, which led to a nickname, but she became. Um, a real folk hero, you know, she married yep. and she had many things going on. But when we say pirate, I have not sold your book as a pirate book, because I do think, I do think people fall into an assumption that it is, you know, about um, treasure and violence and so forth. And that's really not the point of, of no. these. Um, they are, you know, the Republican aspect of life on a pirate ship. There is an actual series on, I can't remember what, um, maybe National Geographic about pirates 
and Ann Bonny, I think, has a role in it, but mostly it's right. about, you know, um, but but here's the thing that I think that people, just speaking um, from years of experience of listening to readers, here's the four questions that people tend to ask about life on a ship. One, food. What did they eat? Two, hygiene. How did that work? Three, medical care, if any, and four, sex. Because, you know, there they are, afloat out there without normal resources, more support, no support, you know, whatever. I mean, we all know about the limeys, you know, the discovery that scurvy could be um, fixed by, you know, taking on ascorbic acid and so forth. How many people think about, you know, I, I loved I loved your description of sailing to Cape Town because I remember it myself sailing down there and, you know, seeing Table Mountain rising up. And, you know, I, I think about posh, poured out, starboard home, but because that was the way that people, at least people of affluence tried to get, uh, that, that meant as they sailed either way around Africa to points east, they could see. Table Mountain, they could see the gardens, which, you know, are still preserved there. There's a, a shred of them. And I also thought of the irony that, you know, you're ending your series, as you said, this this um, tetralogy. Oh, I love that word. We hardly ever get to use it. This tetralogy um, in 1860. But how ironic in a way that the you know who went there in pursuit of freedom um, ended up in the Boer War. You know, because yes, yeah, that yeah. whole area became, you're, you're stopping before them. But what a horrible, you know, brutal flashpoint the Boer War turned out to be, proving that nowhere is really safe. You know, you can emigrate and you can think, you know, great, we'll have a whole new world and build a better society in the whole bit. And then you can't, you can't look ahead to see what forces are no. going to come along. You know, I'm, I'm glad you're stopping before all that. Comes yeah, 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 no, absolutely. And also because... Uh, that's precisely the point that that history there isn't much nuance in that there mm. isn't much space for me as a historical novelist to slip in with my imagined characters and write a story of hope and in the end my story you know I hope when readers are reading my books I want readers to close the book having had a great experience they will have felt big emotions and there will have been lots of ups and downs but in the end my books resolve and uh, I suppose in an old-fashioned sense they are about triumph as opposed to defeat. And so it'd be very hard to write about the Boer War with right. any measure of uh, integrity and end on that kind of a note. Whereas with where I'm stopping now, it's that moment of, you know, there's been a lot of backwards and forwards. The thing that you're right about though, Barbara, that's very interesting that will come in book number four. And I like the fact we've all given it a different uh, title because I, I talk about it as a quartet partly in homage to T.S. Eliot Four Quartets, which is my favourite, I suppose, if I were to have such a thing, um, long form poem. And that's where the elements come from. So for me, you know, it's that. But it's um, the Huguenots went as an invitation to South Africa from the governor of the Cape. And at that stage, it was just a, a, a refueling post. Simone van der Stel, who sent letters back to Amsterdam saying, the land is the same as it is in the southwest of France. If there are Huguenot winemakers as refugees in Amsterdam, I will pay for their passage on a ship. I will pay for their families to go with them. I will pay for a French pastor to administer to their needs. And when they arrive, we will give them a loan to buy a strip of land and tools and vines. And so not exclusively, but in large part, the South African wine industry is down to 28 Huguenot families who were refugees and they went there. But within a hundred years, French had gone. They had become assimilated into Boer culture, African culture. So in the end, they didn't get to keep their identity. It's, it's a very interesting moment. So I wanted to come out before that as well. Um, because I want, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, I, I do believe in delivering readers something slightly uplifting in this kind of genre. Uh, but I think the most interesting thing I would say about your point about pirates and that it's not, maybe, maybe it has a slightly different connotation, maybe in America, I don't know, is that 
this issue of it being a relatively free space is so fundamental when you're writing about women living disguised lives, because that is what that's about. And there was this extraordinary thing called matelotage, which was essentially, and it was almost always two men, obviously, on a, uh, on a ship. Matelotage was when two men, almost always, would pledge themselves to one another to essentially live as a couple. And we don't know quite what that meant, but it did mean that they would share their worldly goods and they would look after each other and all of these things. And mostly when the men were back on dry land, they often had wives and often had families, but then when they were at sea, it was accepted that that was the partnership. And I can't help but find that terribly romantic as well as rather practical. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's just, it just was one of those kind of accepted things in the Navy as well as on pirate ships. So um, obviously, I'm focusing on women, so it's slightly different uh, there, but it's, you know, the hygiene point, what we don't understand is nobody ever undressed. They just didn't undress. They washed, the, you know, people didn't change their clothes, they didn't have other clothes to change into. They might wash their face every now and again. If they did, it would be with seawater. When they needed to do the things that everybody, every human needs to do, they would go to the front of the ship and, you know, they had kind of rather handy little flaps in their trousers. Um, nobody ever really saw other people undressed, which is why women, Bonnie, you mentioned Anne Bonnie, Mary Reed, Granny O'Malley, uh, there was a great Moroccan pirate queen in this period called uh, Saida al Hurra, who was operating out of North Morocco, out of Saleh. And then the, the worst pirate, in a way, female pirate of all time, was a Chinese pirate queen called Chang Shi who, when she surrendered in 1810 uh, to the Qing uh, dynasty, she had 40,000 pirates under her control. She dominated the South China Seas. So all of these women, and Granny O'Malley, absolutely key amongst them, they are documented women pirates who, who existed. And so my Louise Hubert, she's just an imagined version, but she stands in the line of, Pirate queens. <laughs> Would you be upset if um, Louise had turned out to have been not a nice person when you were writing her? Because I mean, she's a marvelous know, person. That is a really interesting point. When I started writing her, she wasn't very nice. And I was interested as I was writing her. And then there was that moment of, I kept thinking, why are you not very nice? Um, you're manipulative, you're um aggressive and then and I had her almost as a kind of was she a goodie or a baddie you know I, I found that that's how she was coming out and then I had that moment of realizing what had happened to her as a child and I thought oh I see so actually you're doing the version of her that is completely has put up very very unpleasant barriers to keep everybody away whereas actually what as a novelist I need to do is find that child that suffered that trauma when she was 10. And at the minute I'd done that, as I started to write her, she became herself. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you, Barbara. Oh, yeah, oh. So the, the other thing about all your novels and this one is that there are deaths. And sometimes they're really shocking. Um, so I don't want to give a spoiler, but there's, I mean, for me anyway, there was a very, very shocking death because it's a character that we've lived with for a very, very long time. And um, off they go. And, um, and I wondered, is it hard for you to, to write out and kill your character? Do you, is it OK to kill your darlings or do you have to kind of write through the tears and, you know, send, send them off? Yes. Um, obviously, if you're writing a, a family saga that will last 300 years, people are going <laughs> to die. I mean, it's just unavoidable. They can't all be Methuselah um, and keep on going. Um, so it is, except in the end, um, I years ago interviewed, it might have even been your year when you judged the Women's Prize, actually, Amanda. Um, Annie Prue, um, I interviewed her once, you know, great Canadian writer. And she said to me, the thing is, Kate, uh, if the characters don't move the plot forward, they die. And... Um, and I'm not like that, but I am pragmatic that what does the story require? So some of the people that we love are going to die on the page 
as opposed to die off the page. That is one of the decisions, like can you kind of spare your reader the gory up close details or not? But um, the only time that I've ever cried, I didn't cry writing that scene in The Ghost Ship, but I have had already, the book's only been out in the UK for like a week now, no, not even a week. I've had so many messages on private, DMs and things from people going, oh my God, I'm weeping. And so, and the horrible part of me thinks, yes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've written that well, I've written that bit well. But when I was writing, you mentioned it before, when I was writing Citadel, the final scene in that where, and it isn't, you're right, it's not a spoiler to say two women die because it is real history and they are the two women of the Carcassonne resistance who have never been identified. And I knew I could write a story about the sort of women they must have been. I knew that one of the people who would die would be the lead character, obviously. You know, everything about being a novelist is about delivering the promise you make to your readers. And obviously she was gonna be there. But I didn't know who the second woman was going to be until the bit I was writing the scene and that made me cry. And I did feel, I am so sorry but it was, the story was the story. You can't just go, oh, well, actually, I'm not going to do that because that's going to upset me because the story requires what the story requires. So we've been talking about Louise because she is this marvellous heroine, but I have to say, you love your villains. I do. Uh, I love you villains. really do. And there's one particular villain and this villain, villain's progeny that just, whenever they're on the page, you know, they're, that it's like Don Giovanni, you know, villain, but at the same time mesmerizing. So do you actually, so what is your relationship then with these villains that makes them so compelling? <laughs> I mean, th there is always an idea that somehow villains are more fun to write than the goodies. I don't find that. I find that um, it's back to, in a way, what we were talking about a moment ago about the characters need to do what the characters need to do. And I find that it is really satisfying writing a, a, a real proper villain, but it's actually more satisfying sometimes writing the person who you're not sure if they're a villain or not. Like, can you trust them? Um, maybe the things they're doing that look really unpleasant, they're doing for good reasons and that will work out. And that's partly, as we were saying earlier about, um, and you know, Barbara was saying right at the beginning, we don't know the consequences of history. We don't know the consequences. And this is what people sometimes forget, as you know, Amanda, about how history looks really clear when you look back on it. Mm. But while people are living it, it's not clear. So obviously in the Second World War in Europe, uh, the French hated the British because we bombed the French fleet. And there's a phrase called the Résistance de l'Anzième Heure, the 11th hour resistance, because until pretty much 1943, France thought that Germany would win. And therefore they were making those relationships. And it's easy to look back and say, what a terrible decision. But it's the, you know, it's the old cliche, as you know, um, that the joke uh, in history is like, men of England, today the 100 years war begins. <laughs> they didn't know it was going to be 100 years when it started. You know. So that's the thing that I'm always very, when I'm writing baddies and goodies and all of those kind of things, that even though they're imagined, they're against the backdrop of real history, they don't know the consequences of what they're about to do. And I find that really helpful when I'm writing evil characters, because then I'm like, how evil are you? I mean, there are a couple of real stinkers in this book, absolutely, where that are unredeemed in any way whatsoever. Um, but, you know, they've got to be there too. And I'm very careful, as you know, that there are gorgeous women and awful women and gorgeous men and awful women, because that's history too. It's like, we're all in the same boat, as it were. Yeah, I suppose so. As somebody once said, we're all, we're, well, we're, perhaps we're all at sea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're all at sea. And what you're doing with your novels is that you are inviting everyone to come onto your boat because the view is better and the company is better. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, I, it, was a, it was a very funny thing that, you know, I'm sure many people listening will be people who sail. 
I um, love to walk beside the sea. I love to look at the sea and listen to the sea in a Wallace Stevens type of way. But I do not want to be in the sea and I do not really want to be on the sea. So the biggest compliment people have been paying me in a way is saying, oh, Kate, I didn't know you sailed. And I'm going, I did not sail. But you see, I have a friend who is a retired rear admiral in the British Navy. And I said, I threw myself upon his mercies and said, I need, I need help here because I belong in woods and landscapes and cobbled stones. And I'm, I know that I can bring that landscape to life. And the challenge of the ghost ship was bringing the seascape to life when I'm not, this is not my, my habitat. But he said this beautiful thing to me. He said, having lent me all the books in the world, and now I know more about knots than I need to know. Um, I, he said, Kate, you just need to close your eyes, imagine yourself on the deck of a ship and listen to the song of the ship. And when he said that, I thought, oh no, I can write that. Because it's about the fact that shipbuilding didn't really change for kind of 500 years. Uh, so you can go and visit a wooden ship on the 17th century, the 16th, the 14th. Essentially, they are built to the same specifications, even if the scale is different. And a ship is never silent. It, they, the wood is contracting and it's shrinking. And there's the singing in the shrouds and the clapping of the rigging and the sails and the uh, rattle of the pail in the galley, which is brick, because the big threat in, on a wooden ship is fire down below. Oddly, not pirates so much, or somebody else's navy, but fire is what scuttled most ships. And so I realised that it wasn't so different, really, because truthfully, ha I haven't ever gone into medieval battle, but I can imagine myself as a chevalier um, in Carcassonne on a horse, um, and so I thought, you know, what I can imagine my ship on the bridge of a ship. And, um, and it was very enjoyable trying to do that, actually. Well, so in terms of imagining yourself doing something, you have, you've written nonfiction, you've written fiction, you've written um, plays, you, you know, you've written essays, you, you, uh, you've written a memoir um, about being a carer and the true meaning of what that means to be a, car a carer. So what, uh, in, in your literary life, because you have a very full non you know, outside as well, um, what do you want to conquer next? I mean, apart from finishing this amazing series, the quartet, quatrain, <laughs> quartet, whatever, uh, so many ways of thinking of this person, but, um, what genre or what, you know, what do you want to scale next? Because you are a person of scale. <laughs> yeah, that's a lovely question. Thank you. But, um, I am really looking forward to getting home, finishing this UK tour. Um, I've got a, you know, the Dutch edition's coming out next week because the Dutch need to publish quite early because otherwise people read it in English instead. So I've, I've got this period of time, which is great. But once I'm home on the 22nd, I will be on grandmother duty all weekend with my 10 month old grandson. And that will be terrific. Once they have gone home, um, I will be starting book number four. It's all ready to go in my brain and I've been dreaming it. But I need now to sit down and see what it is and finish off this story. But after that, um, I have a new series, which is a crime series because I did a Miss Marple story um, and I loved it and discovered that actually, as you say, I always have mystery, but I discovered that I could do clues um, and a puzzle. And the lead character will be uh, a woman who is a journalist and the novels will start in the late 1940s at the moment at which women had been told that there'd be a new world, but actually what happened is the men came home from war, war and the women were told, no, you've got to go back. And you got the beginning of those female journalists in the UK. But I live, and they will be set in England because I live in Sussex and there are several cold cases. In other words, cases that were never solved and remain, uh, but, but they've been put on the back burner as it were. And the lovely records office people have given me access to some of those files so i will be writing a series and i don't know anything about my uh detective except i for some reason just know that her name is dolly hey, that is called very dolly. 
Gosh, what, a wonderful way to, what a wonderful way to end this discussion. Is <laughs> if we have any questions from the audience, I am blown away. I have to tell you, Amanda, while Patrick is popping up, that Kate and I once did the most interesting conversation we might ever have done together, which was Kate agreed to join me to talk to a lovely man at Oxford, and he didn't show up. So Kate and I did this brilliant <laughs> hour without the author, but about the book. And I still remember, <laughs> do you remember that, Kate? Patrick? Yeah, it was, it was very, yeah. It was, it so, was crazy. It and was. We kept expecting him. We were very polite. And then we discovered that nobody had got his number because the publicist had been really protective and she'd gone home. And right. so we just winged it for an hour. We had a lovely time. We oh. did. It was great, but it was sort of like, it was the ghost event, like, you know, the yeah, ghost yeah. ship. It was the ghost author event. Wow. It was really fun. I loved it. Is he the one who'd written the book about Dickens? Yes. Yes, that's right. Yep. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Subsequently, you talked to him. I did. had a great time talking to him. We, we'd worn out everything we had to say. <laughs> we were very knowledgeable. We gave the impression of really being on yesterday in the UK. I chaired an event for Sotheby's, the auction house in London, uh, who are auctioning in London and New York at the moment. It's their books week and they are auctioning some performance scripts of Charles Dickens and so that's not the actual novels but his performance version of David Copperfield of uh, Pickwick Papers of other things and the great uh, actor uh, Simon Callow was mm -hmm. there reading uh, he read from the performance script of David Copp The Death of Steerforth and mm -hmm. it was amazing amazing well, aren't there, I mean, there's so many exciting and wonderful things happening, you know, and it's grand to be a part of it, even if a small part. Patrick, what do we have in from listeners? Um, well, one question is just about, about the research, and you, you've talked quite a bit about that. You mentioned the, uh, the Sabatini book. Um, are there any other, other novels that you kind of can point to? Did you ever read any of the George MacDonald Frazier <laughs> Absolutely, I did. And I would say, particularly for uh, this audience, uh, the Nobel laureate, uh, William Golding, wrote a series of three C novels. Um, and uh, one of them, I've just done a new introduction for one of them, Fire Down Below, and Rites of, um, oh my God, is it called Rites of Passage? That's great. It's, it's late here. I'm not normally up this late, uh, to be honest. Um, but they are really worth reading. They are very powerful. Uh, there is, of course, there was a whole slew of Scottish writers, obviously Treasure Island, obviously The Pirate by Walter Scott, um, obviously uh, Ballantyne, um, Cooper, uh, Fenimore Cooper wrote a pirate novel as well. The thing that is the issue is that they are very much women-free zones. So I did love all of those, um, but I would, commend strangely, particularly since we're now going to South Africa for the last one. Um, slightly unfashionable, of course, Victorian attitudes in many ways that are unfashionable, but in terms of real delivery of adventure writing, as opposed to seafaring novels, Ryder Haggard's King Solomon's Minds. There are many things that are not um, maybe palatable to modern readers, but in terms of pace, and energy and extraordinary female characters as well as male characters. And a hero, Alan Quatermain, who spends most of the novel in tears. So he was a bizarrely new man in a way that he owned his emotions. He wasn't, you know, the guy with the gun who, you know, hit with a strong jaw. Um, so I would recommend all of those. And I'm sure that you, Patrick, will be able to find all of the pirate novels and put them up on the website. <laughs> Certainly. Yeah, let's see. Anything else here? Um, any what's going on in Hollywood or elsewhere? Any any TV or film things of note? Well, there 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 are two um, totally different answers to this one. That firstly, just as a FYI, because obviously this event, and of course I wanted to do it with you, Barbara, and you, Patrick, and the Poison Pen, is my American launch event. But it comes in the week, which is the twentieth anniversary of the release of the first film of the Pirates of the Caribbean. And that just so happens to have fallen here. And Elizabeth Swan, the character played by Kira Knightley, was inspired by Anne Bonny and Mary Reed. 
Wow. You know, that's where the research came from. Uh, so this was not deliberate in terms of the Minotaur publishing schedule or indeed my English publishers, uh, British publishers schedule. But it just so happens to have fallen this week. It's the 9th of July, uh, 2003. Um, in terms of me, uh, my books are uh, quite long and quite complicated and they are quite a challenge and expensive to adapt. But that's OK, because I'm a novelist and for me, film adaptations are simply about bringing more readers in. But Citadel looks as if it's about to happen and it will be a co-production with France if it comes off and that will be amazing. And a novel that many people have liked the most of mine is a novel called The Winter Ghosts, which is the one that has a male protagonist. And that also looks as if that might be about to happen. But you know, truthfully, as a novelist, all of my books are sold for film. The film, when you see it on the screen, it's happening. Until then, not worth thinking about because most films don't get made. So there we go. Just saw something about um, a new Napoleon film, major production. Have you, anybody seen? I can't remember who. Uh, the Joaquin Phoenix. Yes, Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah. that's right. They just released a trailer. That'd be very interesting. Can it, can it compete with Abel Ganz's Napoleon? Who knows? Well, uh, I have you're, opinion not on facing, you're not facing the writer's strike, um, which we are, I'm assuming you're not, if these are UK productions. I, I will, um, I'm going to have to go rest my hand here, but I will leave you with an interesting thought, um, circling all the way back to that great man of history thing. But there, somebody, oddly enough, I think in the Wall Street Journal, which is not the place you'd think you'd find this, um, has made a connection between the first writer's strike in this, which was when in 2008 or something like that. Anyway, the first writer strike brought us reality TV because there were no scripts. And the journal thesis here is that reality TV brought us Donald Trump. My, oh my God. well, no, think about it. it. Really think about it. Um, I think it's a very valid theory and sort of ties into what we've been talking about. My it it really does. But I I don't feel, even as a Brit who has no right to an opinion on this, I don't feel we can finish this wonderful evening um, or afternoon or when everybody's listening to it with Donald Trump. So I'm going to give you a different <laughs> thing, which is this, which is that the very, very first named author in history is a woman. She was Excellent. called Eduana, and she lived in the 23rd century BCE, and she was a high priestess in a temple in Samaria. And everybody had their own uh, high priest or priestess, every god or goddess, you know, writing temple hymns. And nobody knows why she signed her name, because they'd always been anonymous, but she did. And the reason that we know that Enheduanna was the very first named author in history, a woman, is because the site was excavated in the 1920s and 30s by a husband and one uh, wife archaeologist team called Leonard and Catherine Woolley. And they had a young archaeologist assistant who was married to the biggest selling author in world history who of course is dame agatha christie so i yep. feel we finish on powerful women writers we do that absolutely is true. i love max mallow and i think his biography or his own work about his wife is absolutely terrific which i highly <laughs> recommend anyway thank you for saving us from a not very happy ending. I just, I just thought, you know, we were talking about forces of history and how you can't anticipate how things will go. So I thought that was a, a few minutes ago <laughs> when Kate referred to the great actor uh, Simon Callow. I thought she said the great actor Simon Cowell. I'm like, blimey! I didn't realize he was uh, <laughs> a yeah, master yeah, thespian. Yeah. It's time for bed. I'm definitely yes. time for bed for Kate I there in bed. Oxford. But what a pleasure it has been, ladies, to I'm so pleased to meet you, Dr. Foreman, and get to mention your pleasure wonderful to meet work. you. And um, Kate, as always a pleasure. Congratulations again on number Thank you. Uh, we have copies of The Ghost Ship. This is a perfect book to take with you on vacation and really just sort of lose Absolutely. yourself. Absolutely. It's, it's a sub so lounge great. book. Yeah, yeah. And thank you so much, Barbara, for having me. And um Amanda, thank you so, so much for giving up the time. It's always such a pleasure to talk to you. Um, it's a pleasure. Congratulations. Never in the same room. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> right. Bye, everybody. Thanks.